Good morning and welcome to the sixth meeting of the Social Justice and Social Security Committee. Apologies have been received today from Faisal Chowdhury. Our first, first item of business today is a decision to take items three and four in private. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Thank you very much. We are agreed. Our main item of business this morning is an evidence session on refugees and asylum seekers. The committee has been holding some, some standalone sessions to explore the breadth of its remit. We will use the evidence heard during these sessions to begin to establish priorities for our work programme over the parliamentary session. Given that this topic is also of interest to the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, we invited members of that committee to join today's session. In addition to Pam Duncan Glancy, who is a member of both committees, I also welcome Pam Gosal, MSP, to our meeting. And Pam is joining us remotely. And I also welcome to our meeting um, today our panel, who are also joining us remotely. We have Andrew Morrison, who is Chief Officer of COSLA's Migration, Population and Diversity Team. We have Pat Toker, Assistant Chief Officer of Public Health Protection, Complex Needs, Glasgow City Health and Social Care Partnership. And we also have Alistair Denny, Refugee and Migration Programme Manager, City of Edinburgh Council, Callum McIver, Director of Communities Western Isles Council, and we have Councillor Susan Aitken, Leader of Glasgow City Council. So a few housekeeping points before we start. Please allow our broadcasting colleagues um, a few seconds to turn your microphones on before you start to speak. For those who are joining us remotely, witnesses can indicate with an R in the dialogue box in blue jeans, or simply with a show of your hand if that's not working. I'll try and keep my eyes on all of you if you wish to come in in a question. And everyone should check um, that they can see the dialogue box right now um, on the right-hand side of their screen. That would be really helpful. And witnesses, don't feel as if you have to answer every single question. There's quite a few of you today. If you don't have anything new to add um, to what's been said by others, that's absolutely OK. Um, you're also welcome to follow up in writing any points that you think you need clarified or that haven't been covered, um, or supply further information at any points that have been raised after the meeting. Um, and I would also invite members to direct their questions to particular panellists, because we do have a lot to get through this morning. Um, so I'm going to start um, with our questions, um, and I'm going to start off with my colleague um, Natalie Dawn, who's joining us remotely, for questions on theme one, and then I will bring in um, Jeremy Balfour after that. Um, over to yourself, Natalie. Thank you. Thanks, Davina, um, and good morning, panel. Um, can I just, uh, the first question I'll ask is, can, what efforts have been made to improve the data on asylum seekers, refugees, and people with no recourse to public funds? Um, sorry, I will uh, direct that first um, to Susan and Pat, please. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, I think um, Pat will be able to answer this um, in more detail than me, um, is uh, uh, the operational issues um, are very much. Uh, he's the expert on this. Um, what I would say, though, is that the the data is um, owned by the Home Office. Um, Glasgow, in partnership with the Home Office, has been involved in a, um, a data pilot to try and improve. Um, the flow of data uh, into um, not just ourselves, but also to partners such as Scottish Refugee Council, for example, um, and, and obviously the Home Office contractors, MIRS as well. Um, I would say that has had mixed um, success. There, there was an improvement um, in the, the flow of data, which, uh, which did allow us uh, to respond and, and to share information with partners. Uh, but it isn't something that we can compel the Home Office to do. Um, it isn't something we can insist on. It has been an entirely voluntary, uh, that, that arrangement. Um, and I, I think it's fair to say that there, it's been... Um, it's been a little bit patchy, but it certainly it was something that we tried following uh, the um, the previous contractor, uh, Circle, and when they announced that they were going to um, undertake the the, um, the the cessation um, of um, around 300 um, accommodated asylum seekers in the city, and it emerged that in actual fact. Uh, well, we, we as a local authority didn't have access to a lot of the data on those individual households and it emerged that you know a lot of them for example hadn't 
um, exhausted their um, appeals process um, that some of them already had leave to remain, but that that hadn't been shared with us as a local authority. There were there were all sorts of problems and issues um, with the sharing of the data. So we we have worked in partnership to try to improve that. Um, it, it has improved, but I would say there's still um, some quite a, a bit of progress to make um, to uh, to really um, shape our, our understanding of the the status of um, asylum seekers and and indeed um, people who are transitioning to refugee status um, in Glasgow. Um, I think I'll, I'll pass over to Pat at that point because he's been more directly involved in that pilot work. Well, he, he has been directly involved. I haven't. It's been that's been entirely um, officer led. Thanks, Susan. Um, yes, just 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 to add to that, um, the, uh, Susan had mentioned there about the asylum data sharing pilot, um, and that has had some some uh, uh, some has, has generated some improvements for us. Um, what I would say is it remains it does remain very much uh, an ongoing issue. Uh, we do require a lot more data to be able to inform what set type of service we want to be able to deliver, and that's that, that's been a particular challenge. There is a couple of initiatives. For example, there has been national work done with the Home Office by way of a national safeguarding board, which is about getting underneath particularly greater context around adult protection, share protection type scenarios. Um, and that remains very much a work in progress. Um, but it's not it's not yielding any particular uh, positive outcomes for us right now. There is also the work that is a uh, that's happening through the uh, end and destitution strategy, which will be leaning in with third sector partners to the sharing information. We've got better arrangements in terms of sharing information across local authorities about what the experience has been. Um, but it very much does remain, uh, a, 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 as Susan said, a real, a real work in progress for us. Uh, we do have better uh, arrangements with uh, in Glasgow with mayors. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Uh, there is that has that has improved. There's much more dialogue, which allows us to get underneath not just necessarily uh, the the the, great, uh, the detail, but the individual type of scenarios. So there's but there's so the communication has improved. Um, and whilst we are we have some better reporting on data, it still very much remains um, an ongoing piece of work. So I'm going to group a couple of questions together here just to save um, for time. So obviously there's still progress to be made in terms of recording the, uh, in the statistics. So what benefit do you think there would be to have more accurate data on asylum seekers, refugees and people with no recourse to pub public funds? And can I ask, are there any figures available on the number of EEA nationals who have no recourse to public funds? And do we have any statistics on how many people who have claimed asylum do not have access to housing support? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll put that back to you, Pat. Again, if, if that's okay, um, if you don't mind, I can a I can answer what the value of the data would be. Um, yep, I would true. probably defer to um, to Kozla, who have got a greater national context and some some of the the data quite specifically you're looking at. The advancing the the data and the data information share would would, would enhance this considerably. Um, it would allow us, as I touched on earlier on, really to be able to anticipate the type of service delivery better. Um, it would allow us to, on a case by case, be able to case manage better. It would inform our decision making. It would inform our budgets better in terms of where we want to shift resource and where we and where we anticipate trends, for example. We have a long, long established relationship with asylum seeking and refugee um, in Glasgow um, and we're kind of reliant on the figures and the trends that we've experienced over a number of years, it would be great to get to a point where we have something really quite accurate that allows us to anticipate where we're going in the future. Um, a breakdown of specific demographics, for example, including age group, complexity of need, um, anything in relation to kind of past areas of trauma that would allow us to inform where we're going would be, would be considerably helpful as well. Um, so the it's probably not an exhaustive list, to, to be honest, but there is a there is a substantial amount of uh, of improvements that we could make if the information sharing was much more concise and better, up to date and contemporary. 
If we were able to do that, um, uh, that would allow us to move forward with a more informed uh, an informed uh, service delivery. But I think that Andrew would probably be better to give um, the context in terms of national figures, uh, which I know that they've been working on. Thank you, Pat. Hi, Andrew. Hi, good morning. Um, yeah, so just to uh, emphasise what Pat said there in terms of the benefits of having more accurate data, I suppose fundamentally it enables councils to better understand uh, who is in their communities and their needs and then to, to respond accordingly, as Pat was saying. In terms, I think your second question was around EEA national specifically with no recourse to public funds. Is that right? So the, yeah, there was there was two further questions. Figures available in the number of EEA nationals with no recourse, um, and also do we have any stats on how many people have claimed asylum do not have access to any housing support? Okay, so in in terms of EEA nationals, it, it's a we can extrapolate from UK figures, I suppose, as opposed to having definitive figures uh, for Scotland. So, based on UK-wide data, um, and I suppose just to go back a, a stage, so uh, EEA nationals will have no recourse to public funds either if they are refused status and remain in the UK, or if they have not yet applied. Um, and also, there's those who have pre-settled status who have there's ambiguity about. Um, what their rights and entitlements are. Um, so, based on UK-wide data, 205,000 people have been refused as of December 2021. So, that was 3 per cent of total applications. Um, in, in terms of in Scotland, um, as of 30th of September, um, the total number of applications received was 299,720. So, if we can assume that there was the same number of refusals in Scotland, that would be 3 per cent of, of 300,000, basically. Uh, but, but it's an extrapolation of UK data, as opposed to having anything definitive on Scotland. In terms of those who are not being accommodated, um, so, so the, the Home Office have a duty to accommodate everybody who um, is seeking asylum, who has been, uh, who is destitute or is being assessed as, as being destitute. So, on that basis, um, we do not have statistics to suggest that there are large numbers of people who are not being accommodated. In, in fact, we do not have statistics on that at all. So, I, I do not have figures on that. Okay, that is fine. It was not to try and sort of ease out large numbers. It was just to see if that, that data is available. Um, no, that is fine. Thank you. Um, no further questions in this theme, Convener. Thanks. Thanks very much, um, Natalie. I can see that Pat would like to come back in briefly just before I bring my colleague Jeremy Balfour in with his questions. Pat? It um, is just uh, quickly, I do not know if this helps or not, but certainly um, in Glasgow we have um, around about 90 uh, people with no recourse to public funds um, and accommodation just now, and we have 132 EU nationals. We have, we have much more um, uh, no recourse to public funds that are currently supported by uh, our Children and Family Service, and that comes in around about 130. Um, uh, pretty much uh, that has been the same figure for the last couple of years. So you can imagine the associated on costs uh, with, that, with those figures alone. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. No, that, that, that does help. Thanks, thank Pat. Thank you. I'll hand over to Jeremy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Camino, and good morning to um, the panel. Uh, I wonder if I can just look at these, uh, the numbers that we have. And, and clearly, very obviously, Glasgow is taking the overwhelming majority, and um, the kind of central Scotland are, are doing uh, the rest of it. One of the issues that we looked at. Um, in the previous Parliament was whether there should be a greater distribution of individuals across the whole of Scotland. Now, there's obviously advantages and disadvantages to that, but I wonder if I could just ask on, on the figures, particularly maybe start with the Western Isles, do you think it would be more helpful that people who came here were distributed uh, across the whole of Scotland rather than just in one or two local authority areas? And perhaps, uh, is it Callum 
I haven't got my glasses on, so I'm slightly struggling to read names. I apologise. Is it Callum from the Western Isles? Yeah, it, it is, you. yes. And good. Yeah, it is Callum McKeever. Yes, thanks uh, for the question. Yes, in general terms, it, it would be beneficial for refugees, asylum seekers and other economic migrants to be spread across Scotland. I think the criticality in that would be matching uh, you know, the, the people to the locality. So, for example, someone coming to a remote island community who is used, to, you know, who, who has lived in an urban situation in, in their own home country, coming to a remote island community might be very, very challenging. So, finding uh, the people and matching the people who would best fit that type of locality would, would be good. So, both in the Syrian programme and the Afghan programme that, that we've dealt with, we've had good matches. The families that have come to the Outer Hebrides uh, have settled in well uh, and have worked well. But on, on the, the, the prospect, on the wider question, yes, definitely a, a good spread uh, across Scotland would be preferable to uh, centralising in the urban areas. Thank you. Uh, and Karen, can I ask if there was to be a greater number coming to an authority such as yourself, what actual resolution would you require? to be able to make sure that the appropriate services and facilities uh, were available? One, one of the big criticalities for us is, is housing. You know, we are struggling for housing for the, the, the general population, for the local population. Uh, our registered source of land road, uh, Hebridean Housing Partnership, has worked well with us uh, to find accommodation. Uh, so, so that the, these ideas around accommodation are, are absolutely critical. We've had a good experience with uh, ensuring all you know families coming to our area have received you know universal credit. So, all have received you know the appropriate funding that they had. If we had greater numbers, uh, it's questionable whether we'd be able to achieve that. So, having the appropriate housing, having the appropriate support infrastructure. Interpreters around the families will be essential. Again, in, in a remote island community, access to interpreters and, and people familiar with, with cultures it isn't quite so easy to attract, perhaps. Uh, so, making sure the appropriate support services there is, is an absolute criticality. Uh, and, and I go back to my previous point that, that matching the families to the area. Uh, that, that, their, their, that, that their destination is will, will be critical as well. Many thanks. Thank you. I wonder if I could put the same question to um, Kozla, um, Andrew. Um, from a Kozla perspective, is this something that you think we should be looking to do um, as a policy decision, is to have a, a, a greater geographical spread? And have you looked at one of the issues that came up again last time was around legal advice? that the people that um, are getting legal help mostly work in Edinburgh and Glasgow. And it would be very difficult for, say, a asylum seeker who was looking for legal advice if they were in more remote parts of Scotland to be able to have that legal advice. Now, whether Zoom has changed that, I don't know. I've been trying to get your reflection. But as a policy, do you think that should be something we should be striving for? Or do you think we're, how we're working at the moment is the right policy? Yeah, th thanks for that question. So I, I think it's uh, it's useful to. Um, so I think the broad answer is yes. Uh, that that there is support across local government to support the UK's humanitarian programmes, and and that's a unanimous support across all 32 councils. The challenge that we have is around the different schemes, though, at the moment. So with with the refugee resettlement schemes and the new schemes around Afghanistan. Um, all 32 are uh, supporting these schemes and, uh, in the case of resettlement, have all received families. In the case of the Afghan scheme, uh, some have not yet received families, and we will maybe get on, on to that later on. Uh, the challenges around asylum dispersal and the differential approach that the, the UK government has taken to that. So, as Callum was saying, around uh, resettlement programmes, there is an infrastructure that requires to be built up, and, and that includes legal advice, importantly, as you said. Um, and, and local authorities are funded by the UK government um, 
over a number of years to provide those services. Whereas with asylum dispersal, there is no central government funding um, to local government and statutory services whatsoever. And so that makes it a much more challenging ask, and it makes it much more difficult for councils to volunteer to support that scheme because they don't believe that there is the necessary uh, resources to help them to support the people that come in uh, through asylum dispersal. And that's why there's quite a different picture around asylum. But broadly speaking, there is unanimous support from councils to support the UK's humanitarian programmes. And what we've been looking for is a dialogue, meaningful dialogue with the UK government about how we can uh, reform how asylum works so that it's more akin to how um, councils work in relation to resettlement. In terms of legal advice, absolutely, that's, that's a major challenge for councils and remains a major challenge for councils. And you're right that it's centred um, largely, in the, well, actually largely in Glasgow, even more so than even in the Central Belt, and so that causes challenges um, for for accessing, accessing that. Uh, that is a strand of the work that we're doing around ending destitution, and actually, Scottish government have funded uh, COSLA to provide uh, some casework support to help councils with some of the challenges that they're facing. But it's definitely a much bigger challenge that that still exists as it did when. Um, when you addressed the uh, when it was addressed in the committee previously. Uh, thank you, Camille. I'm done up a moment. Thanks very much for that, um, Jeremy. And before I bring my colleague Pam Duncan Glancy and um, Andy, just to stick with that point, can I um, just clarify if you could perhaps um, talk to the, the specific issues that councils across Scotland maybe face when it comes to asylum seeking children um, and how that differs in um, the support that, that's on offer in Scotland versus the rest of the United Kingdom and why that perhaps itself um, gives councils specific problems? Yes, so there's been significant changes around unaccompanied asylum-seeking children in the last six months or so. So, uh, just to go back a, about a year or so, uh, the UK government instituted a consultation um, around how um, unaccompanied asylum-seeking children should be supported, because obviously there's significant pressures, particularly in the south coast of England, um, where where so many uh, young, uh, so many children. Uh, are coming in, and, and there is a significant number who are being accommodated in hotels, even still, which clearly is uh, as far opposed to the, the optimum that, that you could probably imagine. And so, what, what, um, what they came up with, with was a voluntary rota system, which Scottish local authorities, um, further to discussion through um, council leaders, they, they agreed to participate in that on a voluntary basis and had been doing so. And then, towards the end of the last year, uh, end of last year, the the UK government has now made that scheme mandatory. Um, and again, their argument is that they need more councils across the UK to step up to support those children. I suppose the argument from a local government perspective in Scotland was that that we had stepped up and we were looking uh, to support those children already, and were were playing our part in the in the voluntary rota. So at the moment we're in a bit of a state of flux, moving between what was the voluntary scheme and the full implementation of the mandatory scheme. But that will see every council in Scotland likely that some councils have made representations, but it's likely that every council will receive unaccompanied children. And they do receive funding for them in a way that they don't for adults. Um, I think there are particular challenges for those who are over 18, because once they're over 18, there are ongoing responsibilities that councils have to support care leavers, and the, there is a significant shortfall in, in the funding envelopes, particularly for over 18s. Um, I'd be happy to share the, the, the figures on that, if that's helpful, in the back of the meeting. I don't have them in front of me, but we have done work around uh, the costs to councils around uh, care leavers, but also more generally. Thank you very much, Randy. And I think if you did share those figures with us, that would be really helpful, um, considering in Scotland we do have an obligation to, to children who are care experienced up to their, their 26th birthday. Um, I'll bring in Pam Duncan-Glancy, and then after that, Miles Briggs. 
Thank you, convener, and, and good morning to the panel. Thank you for, for joining us this morning. Um, I have a few questions on the no recourse to public funds and um, particularly around the mechanisms that a number of organisations and local authorities and others used during the pandemic to try and support people, for example, through self-isolation support. Um, and I'm particularly keen to, to hear a bit more about the public health um, legislation measures that were used in order to do that and to consider how else um, we could use some of those mechanisms to, to support people um, who have no recourse to public funds. I have another couple of questions on that as well, but if, um, if maybe I could just... Uh, put that to, to COSLA maybe in the first instance, if that's all right, um, and then possibly to Pat to talk about what, what are examples and what were the mechanisms, and then I'll, I've got a couple of uh, follow-ups. Thanks. Yes, thank you. So, um, yeah, as we, we, we hopefully set out a wee bit of information on this mm -hmm. in, in the briefing that we provided, but uh, we um, worked to, um, with, with councils to um, develop a framework uh, to help local authorities use their public health powers to assist people during the pandemic. Um, and that was about providing accommodation to everybody at risk of rough sleep sleeping who would not typically qualify for support, um, and also um, was about considering other needs such as financial assistance, uh, access to food and so on, and, and Pat and other colleagues will be able to talk um, about that in a bit more detail about what they have done. Um, but obviously, uh, during con uh, COVID, we are aware that, that uh, some councils en enhanced the financial support package on that basis. Um, they uh, looked at things around like uh, food parcels, um, uh, free school meal provision, ensuring there was phone contact with individuals and families. We also uh, introduced a mechanism around uh, the social isolation support grant funding to enable that to be provided to those with, with no recourse to public funds as well. So that was all on the basis of work that we did to ascertain through Public Health Scotland that rough sleeping was indeed and is a public health risk during the pandemic. And that was the basis for us developing um, that framework. Um, so I'll maybe, I don't know if I'll leave it there at that point and bring colleagues in for specific information or happy to take any other questions, Pam, at this stage. Good. If, if you if you don't mind, um, could I just add on the the mechanism that you used for the self isolation support grant? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? And also, um, because you've mentioned it just now, um, if it's all right, I'll, I'll pick up the the point about housing and homelessness and the the increase, obviously, in Glasgow to um, twenty seven percent um, the, 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 that we've heard this week. And the government have said that that is partly due to the increased number of applications from refugees who have been granted leave to remain. Could you maybe elaborate a bit on why this would have had that sort of effect on the number of homelessness applications. So I appreciate the two separate questions there, but it was just since you, you touched on it, I'm, I'm keen to uh, keen to ask. And then I have one further question in this area. Okay. Uh, yeah. So in terms of the social isolation support grant, and again, maybe we can provide more more detail in the back of this session. But uh, my understanding is that. Um, it, it was not immediate, uh, immediately allowable in terms of no, no recourse to public funds conditions to pay that um, to people with, with NRPF, and therefore we worked with Scottish Government to develop a, a mechanism that allowed us to pay an equivalent amount of money um, to people who had no recourse to public funds. So that was the position around that. It, sorry, could you? Re Repeat the question, the, the next question that you had, Pam. My apologies. Um, so, it, it, of course, no problem. Thank you, and, th and, and thanks for that, that clarification as well. Um, you, you mentioned that some of the provision that, that local authorities had put in place was around housing, particularly during the pandemic. Um, and I was just keen to, to ask, um, the government have said recently that the, the increase in, in homelessness applications in Glasgow was um, possibly because of an increase in applications from refugees who had been granted leave to remain. So it was just while you were on the, the subject of housing, could you elaborate a bit on why this would have had that sort of effect on the number of homeless applications? Um, 
I, I wasn't aware of what they'd said uh, recently around that, and I, off the top of my head, I can't think why that would be. I, I wonder if colleagues from Glasgow might know more about that, uh, that assertion from the Scottish Government. Happy to take that away, though, and do a wee bit of digging as to why that might have been the case, but I don't know offhand why, why that would have been the case. Thank you. Is there any any panel member from, from Glasgow who may be able to, to help with that? Thank you. That's Norden. Okay, um, yes, I, I, can, I can come in there. There's, there's probably a couple of things. Uh, that I suppose the first of all, um, the, uh, the question around the, uh, the relationship to the increase in housing applications. Um, I, I, I can't comment on specifically what that correlation is. I can definitely get the information to you, uh, and I can get that, that forwarded on. But what I can re respond to is your question around the mechanism that, that was in place in which to support those arrangements around no, no recourse to public funds. Um, and as, as Andrew had already mentioned, Glasgow had worked very, very closely with the Scottish Government on the production of the guidance itself. And uh, this provided us with um, a, you know, a considerable way forward in addressing what was uh, an emerging significant point of pressure for us uh, right at the start of the pandemic. Um, and to give you a little bit of context to this, this does relate to our whole homelessness uh, service provision within Glasgow, our rapid rehousing transition planning arrangements and our rough sleeping agenda, um, and our target to completely eradicate rough sleeping. Um, and, and I think what the mechanism did do for us, it allowed us immediately to be able to access emergency accommodation through our uh, repurposed hotels during the pandemic. Um, and at its peak in Glasgow, we had uh, over 600 people um, in hotels. The figure is thankfully starting to come down. But as I mentioned earlier on, no recourse to public funds population that uh, take up about 90 of those places on any given day um, at the moment. But there was far, far more that have actually since came through. So the mechanism that was in place allowed us to negotiate with legal, third sector, food parcels, phone provision, everything else uh, that Andrew has just described, um, and really put us on the front foot mm. for the first time in a very, very long time to support this population in transitioning. Um, and the other thing, and, it's, and, and, I, and I do feel that this is very, very important to highlight here, um, the staff within the Health and Social Care Partnership and Third Sector and all of the partners inherently want to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And this gave a mechanism to do the right thing. So by providing us, providing uh, this population with emergency accommodation, it has to, in all intents and purposes, for this population, completely eradicated rough sleeping. Glasgow reports currently five rough sleepers in the city centre of Glasgow, for the size, scale and, and, and demographics of a city like this, that's considerable progress for us. Um, it's important to point out that pre-COVID uh, levels were around about 30. So uh, this, is, uh, this has been quite a significant shift for us, and the, and, uh, and the guidance provided the mechanism in which to, to, uh, to really um, get underneath it and really promote really much, much better cohesive, joined-up partnership arrangements and much better outcomes for the service user. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Pat. I did see Councillor Aitken um, indicating that you wanted to speak. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Susan. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks. Sorry, I, I can't get the chat to work for some reason. But um, yeah, it, it was really to, to reinforce what Pat said, but also I think to, um, to th there is a, um, a danger here of conflating. I think a number of issues. There is um, there's the no recourse to public funds issue, which um, we the, the public health. Um, emergency has allowed us to deal with that in a different way with the outcomes that Pat has, has talked about um, with actually positive outcomes compared to the position that we are in previously where, as a local authority, we are actually very restricted um, by law in the way in which we can support people with no recourse to public funds, although there are, are always um, groups out currently, I think, around um, 130 or so, um, Pat um, will be able to give the exact numbers of families, particularly families with children, who we are able to support. Um, but large numbers of people with no recourse to public funds are, are single men, for example. Um, and it's been the public health emergency that has allowed us to put um, 
a new support structure in place um, and, and allowed um, many of those to transition. I should say that right now in Glasgow, there are no uh, negative cessations taking place. In other words, um, the end of um, and, and, and people being evicted from, from asylum accommodation because they are, they are considered appeals exhausted by the Home Office. That is not the case in the rest of the UK. Um, that, the, it's, it's back to, to business as usual in the rest of the UK. It's because we, we in Glasgow have been very insistent with the Home Office that negative cessation should not uh, um, start again while we are in a public health emergency. And, and we have continued with that. Um, the, the Home Office are very keen to restart negative cessations. So the systems that we have put in place throughout the pandemic um, at the moment, I'm not sure how long we're going to be able to continue with those, because when the Home Office decide to restart negative cessations, it will, I think it will make it very challenging for us as a local authority to continue providing that additional support for, for people with no recourse to public funds who, who we would not ordinarily be able to support anyway through social work legislation. Um, so th there's, there's a real challenge coming up there, I think. Um, potentially, particularly with that cohort of, for example, um, single men who are um, who are deemed appeals exhausted um, by by the Home Office. Separately from that, there is um, our our homelessness system and and the pressures that are on that um, day to day. Um, and and in a big city like Glasgow, those pressures are always extremely significant. But during the pandemic, have grown. Um, considerably. Now, there are a whole number of reasons for that. Um, and, you know, we could spend a long time talking about the pressures and stresses that have been put on households. Um, the, the more recent ones, I mean, you know, I think the, um, the, the universal credit uplift and, and the removal of that will undoubtedly have an impact on the numbers of applications. It has always been the case that once someone has been through the asylum process um, and, and if they get a, a positive outcome and they are given leave to remain in the UK, they then move on from being accommodated by uh, the Home Office contractor, uh, now Mears, to, bec to, to becoming our responsibility as a local authority. Um, and we then work with um, our, our registered social landlord partners and with, with others to get those people accommodated. Um, because they, they are now, they're then, um, they're, they're, you know, um, they are citizens of Glasgow at that point, and, and uh, they become our responsibility, and it is a responsibility we take very seriously. So there is always, and always has been, since Glasgow has been an asylum authority, a proportion of our, um, our homelessness applications are made up of people who have been given um, leave to remain in the United Kingdom. Um, whether there has been a significant increase in that recently, I'm not aware of that. Um, I, it, it may be the case, but it is always the case that Glasgow has that um, cohort within our homelessness applications that doesn't exist anywhere else in Scotland, um, because we are the only asylum dispersal authority in Scotland. So it was, it was just, just to clarify that, um, there, you know, that, that will definitely be um, an element of our current homelessness applications. But the reasons that homelessness applications have increased um, are, are complex and varied um, and are to do with a, a range of uh, stresses um, that are being put on, on all types of households just now um, that are, are, are pushing them to the point of, of crisis. And I should say to which we as an authority, as a local authority, are responding um, and uh, Pat will be able to confirm, but there were, you know, there were not just thousands, but, but into tens of thousands of um, of offers of emergency accommodation made to people um, making um, applications during uh, the pandemic over over the past couple of years, and th and that continues. And um, so it was, it was really just to clarify that there there is a um, I, I, I think. There are two different issues going on here, and while they do overlap with each other, they're not exactly the same issue. Thank you very much for, for that, Susan. I can see that Pat would like to come in. If you want to come back in just briefly, Pat, before I hand over to Miles Briggs, thanks. Uh, yeah, really, just to confirm that figure, uh, since the pandemic had commenced, uh, the offers of emergency accommodation have been well in excess of 20,000 in Glasgow. Thank you very much. That's 
On you go, Mike. <laughs> thank you, thank you, convener. Good morning to the panel, and thank you for joining us today. Um, I wanted to ask a couple of questions with regards to um, the pressures which councils will be facing. Um, and the COSLA briefing, which was very helpful, highlighted a number of these um, on local authorities, particularly the pressures on Glasgow City Council and the City of Edinburgh Council. Um, so I wanted to ask the panel um, if they would comment on how they manage to balance those resources, but specifically, what work are they doing with the third sector, who can play, obviously, a very important role to help assist, especially people um, who have no recourse to public funds. Um, so I'll maybe start with Callum and then um, go to Susan. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, you know, resources are a huge challenge to, to councils uh, at the moment, and we're having to take very difficult decisions and make very difficult choices about how we utilise uh, available funds. The third sector for us are, are a critical partner, and uh, we work closely with them to help uh, across a range of, of different services. We are lucky in, in, in this area uh, refugees, uh, asylum seekers, in that our numbers are very, very small, uh, and therefore we can put in place very bespoke services uh, and get very close to, uh, to to the families we have. So we have worked in, in close collaboration uh, across the health services with a registered social landlord, with, with the third sector, to ensure that there have been uh, appropriate supports in place. But if the numbers for us began to get any bigger, it would be a real challenge to, to finance that, to resource that, uh, and to work with families in the very bespoke way that, that we're able to do uh, at the moment. Um, would anyone else like to come in on, on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to come in a wee bit on that as well. I think, uh, you know, Andrew has already said <laughs> Um, from the point of view of being an asylum authority, um, sorry, my dog's decided to burst in just at this point. Um, we, uh, we we are not funded for that at all. Um, so Glasgow receives um, no funding from the UK government, the Home Office, for being an asylum authority, um, because that is um, deemed to be uh, provided through through the private contractor. Um, who, who provides the accommodation. Now, in actual fact, um, as Pat's already indicated, there are very significant costs. Um, so where we support um, uh, children, families with children who have no recourse to public funds, for example, that is a cost that is, is significant because they, these are often very, very complex needs that we're dealing with. I mean, the, the whole of the asylum seeker and refugee population um, is is a traumatised population who, who do have complex needs. And I, I think you know, we, we do have to emphasise that these are, um, these are um, people who, um, to, to a greater or lesser degree, every single one of them um, requires support of some kind um, because, because they have come from a very traumatic situation. And indeed, the whole process of, of um, removal and going through asylum itself is, is, is traumatic. Um, so we... Um, that, that cohort, um, uh, uh, there are very significant costs associated with that, which we carry entirely as a local authority. Um, I think because, as Pat's already indicated, because we believe it is the right thing to do, that we, you know, we want to have these services in place for people. Um, we are um, funded uh, for unaccompanied asylum-seeking children, uh, but not to the extent that, so I think it's always the case that Glasgow has more unaccompanied, unaccompanied asylum-seeking children than we are directly funded for um, by the Home Office. So again, that's an additional cost um, as we support those children through our, um, our children's services um, or through foster care or, or wherever, uh, wherever we, they're, they're placed. Um, so it, it is a significant challenge. I, I think I'd, I'd want to just... Um, quickly make a point that uh, I want to make sure is isn't lost, perhaps, in this discussion. For all of the, the challenges that we will talk about and the nature of this discussion is that we probably will end up focusing on the challenges and the difficulties that being an asylum authority has caused for Glasgow and does right now. I would want to emphasise that um, 
we believe in Glasgow City Council, and I think that the population in Glasgow believes that having been an asylum dispersal authority has been of enormous benefit to Glasgow um, and indeed to Scotland, that it has been a good, um, a, a, a social good that has, has benefited, um, you know, the diversity that it's brought um, to our city, to, to Scotland as a whole, um, to Glasgow's communities. Um, has, has been something that we absolutely welcome. So I need to make that clear. And we are committed um, to being and, and remaining an asylum dispersal authority. Um, but the challenges that are put in our way by the way the system operates just now are significant. Um, and at the moment, we do uh, carry, um, carry those pretty much in their, their entirety. Uh, the, um, the refugee settlement programmes are different. Uh, they are funded. Um, now, I think there are, there are questions over whether they're funded um, to, to uh, the extent that they require to be to make them as effective as possible. Our repeated message, though, um, and it goes back to an earlier question about, um, about the, the, the difference between where every, every local authority in Scotland takes part in the refugee resettlement schemes, but only Glasgow as an asylum dispersal authority, our repeated message has been that if the asylum system were treated as the, the Syrian and now Afghan resettlement programmes have been treated and funded from the outset and local authorities provided with that resource, then the local authorities' responses um, at every right across Scotland would be able to be much, much more effective. And the outcomes that we seek, both for asylum seekers and refugees and, in, um, and receiving communities in terms of successful integration uh, would be delivered much, much more effectively. Um, and it is that lack of upfront funding um, for local authorities in the asylum system that is the barrier to other local authorities joining um, Glasgow and being dispersal authorities, but also continues to place very significant challenges um, in our way as Glasgow City Council um, in ensuring um, and, and, and trying to direct the best possible outcomes and the best interests both of people seeking asylum in the city and the receiving communities as well. Um, thank you for that. Can I bring in, I know Andy, Alistair and Pat um, all wanted to come in, so I'll bring in Andy and, and specifically just to refocus uh, my question with regards to the third sector. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just just to uh, emphasise a couple of points that, that uh, Councillor Aitken was mentioning, and then I'll mention the, the, the third sector as well. So it was just to say in terms of, of, of asylum, um, we, together with our partner local government associations across the UK and local government across the UK and, and in devolved government, have been trying to work with the UK government to, to um, demonstrate the costs of of support and asylum dispersal specifically, and we're continuing to do that work. Just making that that, that point that Councillor Aiken made about about the need for resource to to support um, the work that's done in asylum. And I was just going to mention as well, in terms of NR, uh, NRPF cases, and this comes on to your question as well. I think there's a couple of actions in the ending destitution together strategy that are probably worth flagging here. So, first of all, in terms of um, Councils uh, having the resource to support um, people with uh, NRPF and specifically destitute families with children and vulnerable adults. Uh, it, we've been doing a couple of things. One, we've been working with local authorities to try and get a clearer picture of what the costs are to them. And then on the back of that, what we want to do is work with Scot Scottish Government to agree a future funding model that actually uh, supports um, these people appropriately. And the other action that's maybe of particular interest to you in terms of your question is, is another action in the strategy around um, developing an action plan with what's called the Everyone Home Collective. And that's about um, creating a route map to ending destitution. And that's working directly uh, with third sector partners and with academics. And it's about trying to scale up community-based accommodation provision in cases where local authorities won't be able to accommodate people due to the immigration rules. So that's a piece of work that's underway. Chari the charities that are involved in that, and there's a number of charities that are involved in that, are looking to uh, scale up 
models and work with um, major funders to try and bring in resources so that they can, as well as the, the support that is provided by local authorities and by government, uh, that they can kind of step in to fill that uh, void that currently exists in terms of supporting people who aren't entitled to statutory support. Thank you. And Alistair? Thank you. Whilst we can and do liaise with the wider third sector and other partners to support people with NRPF, the single biggest financial impact on City of Edinburgh Council is housing costs. And whether we are supporting people under public health legislation, and just briefly, uh, the impact of COVID has been to see the numbers and cost of supporting people with no recourse to public funds increase sevenfold in Edinburgh, or um, whether it is under social work legislation, the housing cost is one entirely borne by the Council, and the third sector's ability to help us with that is limited. Thank you. And, and finally, Pat, and then I'll merge my, my other questions into one convener, just for time. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, just uh, quite specifically in relation to the third sector, um, I, I think that if the pandemic has taught us anything over the last couple of years in Glasgow, is that the, uh, the partnership arrangements with third sector are more important than ever and ever before. Um, and, and slightly to reiterate what other people have already said, but there is a way of mitigating risk and mobilising our third sector partners in a really quite a cohesive way that can produce really the outcomes that we want. Um, and what I mean by that is, um, is where there is a, a non-statutory requirement, for example, where there is not a requirement for statutory social work services to be involved, third sector play an absolutely critical, vital role within that. Um, and during the earlier days of the pandemic, we stood up a city centre risk uh, meeting within Glasgow, given the complexity and need in the city centre, with the influx of over 600 people in hotels. Um, we were, only to, we, we were only able to properly mitigate that risk with the relationship with third sector partners. So I, I think that it's important to highlight um, just the, the role, really, that they play um, within that, um, and that if we are to genuinely be um, trauma-informed in our approach and the way that we work, we have to accept that there is a role for everybody to, to play uh, in that where there is not a statutory requirement. Uh, thank you very much for, for that. I wanted to move on in terms of budget pressures, specifically this coming budget. We know in terms of uh, the concern which is being expressed around uh, council cuts to funding. Um, specifically at the Local Government Committee, we had Martin Booth, who colleagues from Glasgow will know as the Executive Director of Finance at Glasgow City Council. He was representing the Society of Local Authority Chief Executives and Senior Managers. Um, but he did express concern um, around support for English as a second language which would undoubtedly uh, come under challenge during these budgets. Now, we know that amongst the school population in Glasgow, around 100 different lang languages are spoken. So I wanted to ask, how is that specific issue around um, the need for language assistance to access services prioritised by councils? Um, and I'll maybe bring in Susan, and if anyone else wants to answer that, can they put an R in the chat as well? Thanks. Um yeah, so that's that is uh, um, an education service in Glasgow. Um, English is an additional language, which obviously um, is, for, for the reasons you say, some very important. Um, our schools are um, very diverse. I don't think there's a single school in Glasgow which which doesn't have uh, pupils who have English as, as an additional language. Um, but th there are some where there are there are dozens um, of languages represented within the school. So it is an incredibly important service. Um, it is when budgets are tight because it is it is not um, necessarily seen as as a core service um, in terms of teacher numbers. It is one that comes under challenge. Uh, what I would say is that it's a priority for us um, in Glasgow. Uh, we are we are going through our budget process just now, um, and that um, you know so it will be uh, another. Um, three weeks or so before the outcomes of that, it is certainly from the point of view of the administration, uh, we will do everything that we possibly can to protect that service because we do think it's it's absolutely essential um, and that it's it's the loss or the, the um, reduction of that service would have a, um, a detrimental knock-on effect in, in a number of areas. Um, it is absolutely crucial. Um, obviously, there are, there are also um, 
um, EEL services for um, for people who are older than school age, uh, many of which are provided through the further education sector, through our colleges, for example. But the, the specific uh, service that we provide in our schools um, is, is one that is particularly important for Glasgow and one that we, we certainly uh, want, even in the face of budget pressures, to, to retain um, and, and ensure that it isn't diminished. Thank you. I'm not sure if anyone else wants to come in on that. Um, no, I'm not no. seeing anything in the chat. Um, if, uh, in that case, can I go back on my word and ask <laughs> another question, which I'll do very, very, briefly, very briefly, and it follows you. on from that. It's with regards to access to healthcare services. Um, often the language barriers around that are, are critically important as well. So I wondered, um, in terms of directing this question towards Pat, what um, work is underway around that? Because it's often, um, we know, barriers to access to healthcare already exists for homeless people, but people who, uh, who don't have English as a, a first language. Um, and again, if anyone else would like to come in on that question, can they put an R in the chat? Thank you. Thanks, Convena. Uh, um, apologies, I, I, I can't comment on the education part of it that's, that, that's happening uh, within the schools in relation to the first question. Um, but we do have um, a really comprehensive um, interpreting services within Glasgow. Uh, and we have uh, constantly customised that service in relation to the, the different languages that's required and also the increasing prevalence of the challenge as well. Um, and it's something that we're particularly proud of in Glasgow that we've managed to achieve. Um, it will remain a challenge moving on, but, is, uh, but remains very accessible. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Pat. I'm going to hand back over to Pam Duncan Glancy for a question, and then I'll move on to my colleague Marie McNair. Thank you. And thank you, convener, for, for indulging me in a further question on this particular issue. Um, I'm just keen to understand a little bit about the support for women who are experiencing um, d domestic violence, in particular um, in the refugee and asylum seeking community. Um, I note that there is uh, concerns around a lack of clarity and funding gaps and support for, for women in these circumstances. Perhaps could um, maybe Pat and, and Councillor Aitken um, set out what, what their understanding of that is and what they can do um, to support women in those circumstances. And can I just also put on record my thanks to Glasgow Women's Aid and women's aid organisations across the country for what they've done um, in this year, but also in, in many others to support women. Over to yourself, Pat, first, and then I know that we have Andy from COSLA who would like to come in. Yes, uh, yes, I can, I can answer that. Um, there is an enormous amount of work going on just now in relation to domestic abuse uh, in Glasgow. Glasgow HSCP will be producing their first whole system strategy later on this year, uh, with a target date of April. Um, we are consulting currently with uh, everybody involved, including uh, Women's Aid um, and all of our key uh, partners, but principally their lived experience population in Glasgow, and that extends clearly to the uh, asylum-seeking refugee population within Glasgow as well, and drawing on what their experience has been. We are currently um, engaged with uh, Professor Breach Featherstone from Huddersfield University and have been for the last couple of years in producing what will be a very contemporary uh, strategy, and as I have mentioned, it will be whole system, it will be children, it will be families, it will be adults, older people, alcohol, drug recovery services, mental health services, and really everything else in between. Um, it has been, as I said, a, a fairly substantial piece of work, um, which, to be fair, it was stood up at the beginning of the pandemic. There was a very reasonable assumption that, with lockdown conditions, that uh, domestic abuse would, in its own right, um, be more hidden than it already is, uh, and it would become more complex. And, uh, and then with the aftermath of that, we'd be picking up the pieces, if you like. But um, what we have done is mobilised all of this around, around all of these services, um, principally through uh, justice services, mostly through child protection services and child and family services. And clearly, that brings in this entire population. So um, really, to answer your question, um, we have been really keen to cut across what the interdependencies are and the complexities, not least around the trauma associated with domestic abuse in the asylum-seeking refugee population, but also 
people uh, with disabilities, for example, also people uh, experiencing mental health, uh, alcohol drug recovery services across the entire piece. So it's, it's something that we're very, very excited about because, it is, as I said, it is entire whole system and whole system approach, whereas up until now, our approach has mostly been delivered by the respective care groups that I had mentioned there. So uh, uh, as a, um, uh, it will go out to a public consultation for a three-month period, um, and that will likely that will likely take place around about March, April. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. I don't know if um, Councillor Aitken, you had wanted to come in on that. I know that I thought Andy did, but he was for the point beforehand. Uh, no, I, I don't. I really have anything. I'm, um, Pat's outlined the work that's going on in Glasgow very well. I think it is, you know, it will be a significant step change in the way that we approach uh, domestic abuse and, and, and gender-based violence services in the city. We, we have it's, it's been one of the priorities identified by our, our social recovery group, which was established, um, which is, is multi-agency, um, all the partners around the table, uh, which the council convened quite early on um, in the, the first lockdown. Um, and uh, Violence Against Women gender-based violence is one of the priorities that has emerged from that and the work that uh, Pat is describing. Um, I, I think I think he's right. I think it is exciting. It's um, it, it, We could really see um, a big step change in a, a new era for uh, partnership working across these services and accessibility and reach for these services um, improving considerably as a result. Thanks very much for that, Susan. Um, I'll now hand over to um, my colleague, Marie McNair, and then that followed by Natalie Dawn. Thank you. Marie? Uh, good morning, convener. Uh, uh, good morning, panel. Um, most of my questions on this theme have been covered, but um, and I know that you've um, highlighted the problems already with access and data, but did you have any indications of the level of unmet need? Uh, I'll pose that to Pat uh, and Andrew, if possible, and then anybody else who wants to come in on it. Um, uh, sorry, can you repeat the last part of the question again there? Apologies. I'm just asking, do you have any indication of the level of unmet need? I know you've already spoken, you know, highlighted the problems with access and data, so if you could maybe ask, answer that, that would be great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think that really to answer that and probably um, to do it justice, um, it will. We have we have an acknowledgement that what we want to do is drive forward more service delivery with a lived experience. Um, I touched on that earlier on around uh, domestic abuse, but it's particularly important for this population. Um, we know that we are not um, not always aware of past trauma, and as I touched on earlier on, for us to be genuinely a truly trauma-informed organisation, we need to understand that better. So the, the the way in which we engage, uh, the way in which we extrapolate and obtain information from service users, um, and, and and agreeing on who is the correct person to do that, it's not necessarily always social work, for example perhaps more uh, advocacy support of the third sector, uh, to, to drive forward about effectively where um, what service users are telling us against what, what we already know in terms of the research or what we think that we already know will continue to shift and, and develop the services we move forward. Um, a large part of that was generated from um, the, the aftermath of the Park Inn uh, shooting in Glasgow where we had engaged and consulted with everybody that was affected by, with that. Uh, we engaged with everyone for the coming week after. It was a very, very intense piece of work. We were assisted greatly by MIRS and by Scottish Refugee Council and by the Health and Social Care Partnership um, in sitting down with individuals. And that gave us a sense of, of a lot of the unmet need uh, that people were describing. Um, mostly impacted by poverty. In fact, probably most, or, or, almost all of it uh, was intrinsically um, in, in, in related to, to poverty, and some of it was, was fairly straightforward. We touched on access to, uh, to mobile phones earlier on, uh, internet access, the accessibility all, all, all of all of that, and we have made uh, changes to that, um, and for people to make sure that they are access and contact with their own family. But in identifying unmet needs, going to be a, Will, will be a, a, a continued a continued piece of work for us. So I hope hope that 
goes somewhere towards answering your question. No, that, that's absolutely fine. Um, you've highlighted that some funding has been available in Scotland to assist. What other ways do you think um, there are to provide financial support to people with no recourse to funding, uh, public funding within uh, the devolved powers that we have? Yes, um, I, I, we've spoken a lot today about the, the role of third sector, um, I, I, and I think that for this population, that otherwise, you know, the, the statutory services and social work are, and uh, the um, local authorities are somewhat constrained with, there is opportunities and greater opportunities for, for third sector to do that. It would be something that I think that would be really helpful if there was a further consultation on what what is the, a realistic uh, financial budget for third sector to pick this to pick this up, uh, especially um, when when we know that there is a uh, a substantial proportion of this population that don't require that ongoing statutory type role, type of engagement, touched on earlier on in relation to the children and families aspects of this. But when it comes to adults, it's not as clear in relation to um, how we can how we can intervene, notwithstanding adult support and protection legislation, for example, and the mental health legislation. But there is a, there is a requirement to mitigate the impact of past trauma in a different way. And I think that there is um, there is greater opportunities there for third sector to find their role and for them to be funded in that regard and funded um, on a more recurring basis. And I think that that is that's just one example I could think of that would be uh, would be of uh, greater assistance. And clearly, any other alternative arrangements that would mitigate uh, poverty. We touched we've touched on throughout this discussion um, the. Uh, the subsistence that's providing is provided is is not necessarily uh, 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 you know have have any parity to what is the uh, uh, welfare benefits, um, which is already a, a minimum. So there is there is a gap in between that. So any way that we're able to mitigate the impact of that and make sure that that uh, we remain as poverty aware as we possibly can. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for, for that, Marie. Um, I'm going to bring in my colleague, um, Natalie Dawn, who's going to speak to um, the Afghan Citizens Resettlement Scheme and ask questions on that for a moment. Thank you. Over to you, Natalie. Thank you, Convener. Um, my first question I'll direct it to Alistair and Councillor Aitken, but if anybody else wants to come in, please let me know. Um, how, if you can advise how local authorities are supporting Afghan families that have already arrived how they are preparing to support future Afghan families. Thank you. Uh, from Edinburgh's perspective, uh, we have only so far supported families in bridging accommodation. Uh, we have been working with some 30 or so households in September in bridging hotels. Uh, the support that we are providing them is largely built on the model uh, largely based on the model that we developed on the back of our Syrian uh, resettlement support. So, school placements, language learning, um, but as of course it is temporary support and we don't know how long these families are going to be with us, there is a limit to the wider support that we would offer uh, in terms of, for example, supporting towards onward and permanent accommodation. Uh, employability. Uh, we have those links, but we just haven't been able to bring them into place for that population as yet. However, we are on the point of having discussions with the Home Office directly about some households with a view to getting them permanently accommodated in Edinburgh. So, our support for Afghan families at the moment is necessarily limited by the temporary nature of their stay in Edinburgh. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Yep, yeah, no, on you go, Natalie. Sorry, on you go. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, we're um, currently supporting um, 37 uh, Afghan families through the, the current scheme, but uh, Glasgow has been supporting Afghans uh, to resettle since about 2014. We have a very substantial um, Afghan population in the city, um, which is, is a very active a uh, population, um, very, uh, um, a very um, uh, proactive community, uh, very mobilised. So uh, they are, um, I know, providing a lot of 
um, informal support and, and putting a lot of, uh, you know, activating their networks to support people as well. Um, but we, uh, yes, as, as um, uh, it was said for Edinburgh, that, you know, the experiences there from the Syrian resettlement scheme, um, and, and indeed, uh, although it's 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 a different system um, and approached in a different way um, from our um, asylum dispersal experience as well um, of of supporting people um, through the process into accommodation. Um, the challenge uh, at the moment is um, there is uh, uh, the, basically the process is, has been very slow. Um, so we are working uh, with. Uh, very closely with our uh, registered social landlords in the city, and um, they have, I uh, have to say, have been um, superb as as they always are uh, in making offers of accommodation. Uh, but the matching process from the Home Office um, is it has been very slow. So people are being left in hotels uh, for really for far too long, um, and you know the. That means there's very limited information on the complexity of the need um, or um, their associated trauma to allow us to prepare for, for supporting them when uh, when they are finally matched and arrive in the city. Um, we've uh, currently, I think, got 13 offers of properties not matched. Um, so, you know, we, we could have higher numbers of people in the city than, than we have already. Um, so we, we do have... Um, real concerns about that because ultimately then we, there's there's the pressure on the um, on the accommodation. Uh, you know we've already talked about the um, the, the pressures on the, the homelessness system um, and on housing more broadly. So we we can't. It's very difficult for um, in our case our because um, Glasgow isn't the landlord in our case our. Um, our, our housing association partners to leave these offers open indefinitely while we wait um, for the Home Office to do the match. Um, so that, that puts some real uh, challenge on the system. Um, and, uh, and, and we know, of course, and in Glasgow, we know uh, from, from bitter experience uh, that leaving people in hotels for, uh, for any longer than is absolutely necessary um, is very, very detrimental to their well-being um, and to um, having good outcomes in terms of transitioning them into support and, and ultimately what we want to do, transitioning them uh, to, to recover from trauma um, and, and to be able to um, approach um, having normal lives um, in wherever, wherever they have been resettled um, in the UK. So, um, a, a number of, of issues just now, but in terms of the, the people that we do have in the city, um, I suppose our, our experience and the long-standing systems that, that we have in place uh, kick in, um, supported by uh, colleagues in the RSLs in the third sector, particularly Scottish Refugee Council, and, and in that very um, thriving and active Afghan community that we have in Glasgow. Okay, thanks, Councillor. Can you actually answer to my my second question, which was about issues with between the the bridge and hotels and the permanent accommodation? Um, I'll I'll pass back to the convener just now. Thank you very much um, for that, Natalie. I think that Pat wants to come in on on, on that point, Pat. Um, it was it was just to uh, it was just to give a, a little bit of more kind of operational context as well, just to to, to add to what Councillor Aitken's already provided. Um, this was already touched on. We've been doing this very established, very experienced in this since 2014, and we continue to do so. Um, but the um, the support and, uh, uh, um, and and promoting the stability for the Afghan fans co uh, coming into Glasgow is supported by uh, our, also our Asylum Bridge and Health Team in Glasgow. Which is in the last couple of years has seen quite a considerable enhancement, commensurate with the increase in, in, uh, in, in proportion of families coming in, um, and that makes sure that there is that community connectedness, connected to, to the health provision that is that's necessary, that's required, um, the connection to ongoing legal advice, um, and critically that support that we've already spoke a lot about here today with third sector partners to make sure that the experience. Um, is as seamless as it possibly can be, and this is something that we are, as we've touched on, really quite established now in Glasgow. Um, and the infrastructure of support that is wrapped around that um, is is really strong. 
Um, but the, the challenges, um, as Councillor Aitken has already pointed out, um, in relation to the existing pressures with um, registered social landlords, particularly in COVID times, has has been challenging. Ha, uh, it has absolutely been difficult, and where there has been voids created as a consequence of that, it has culminated in substantially more costs uh, to the um, to the local authority. Thanks. Thanks for. That, Pat, I do understand um, that Natalie Don does have one further question that she would like to ask on the back of that. Natalie? Thank you. Apologies. Um, I, I thought one of my colleagues was coming in there, but I do have one further question just on that, and thank you, thank you for your answers. Um, I, I, I'm direct this question to Andrew, please. Um, so, in terms of the Afghan Citizen Resettlement Scheme, the Scottish Refugee Council have criticised limitations. Um, and that the UK government is only going to count is sorry is is counting um, refugees already here within that twenty thousand person limit that they've put on. So, what are your views on elig eligibility to the scheme? And is there not a real risk that people who should be accessing this scheme won't be able to because they can't apply independently um, as as a result of the referral requirements? And in this light, do you think that the UK government aims in terms of the numbers are high enough, or could we take more people than that twenty thousand limit? Okay, uh, yeah, th thanks, uh, Natalie. And, and maybe I just go back just a, a wee second. I was just going to put a wee R in the sidebar there uh, before I, uh, I came in. Uh, just to build on what Councillor Aitken was saying around the matching challenges, and just to emphasise that what she was is saying in relation to Glasgow is replicated across the country, and there is real concern from from local government, not just in Scotland again, but across the UK around a, a large number of properties that are uh, sitting empty, um, awaiting um, Afghan refugees, and and it, it's you know the longer people are in hotels, obviously the the more problems manifest themselves for the families, as Councillor Eight can set out. But there is also Challenges for local authorities; they, they can't indefinitely hold on to properties when there is a requirement to, to house other people as well. So that's something that we're seeking urgent dialogue with the UK government on, uh, as are our colleagues across the UK. Um, in terms of Scottish refugees' uh, uh, criticism, I'm, I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure what the specifics around their criticism is or are. I'm wondering if it's they're saying that the uh, this limits that they're they're talking about the the limited number of people that are going to come into the UK through the scheme because they're already counting people that yeah. are already in the UK. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that they've said before. Was that the specific criticism? Yeah. So I, I can read the quote out to you. We're concerned about the strict limitations around who is eligible to apply for help under the scheme. And that it will leave many thousands of people still at risk of harm in Afghanistan and neighbouring countries. We're also shocked that the UK government plans to count people who are already in the UK, those who were evacu uh, evacuated sorry, from Kabul, along with British forces in August, within the 20,000 new places offered by the scheme. So, yeah, on the limitations. Okay, okay. So, so I'm not sure Cosler would have a particular perspective on that. I think um, our Concern, I suppose, is a broader one about um, knowing who is in the country, because I think there are still questions around the rights and entitlements of those who the UK government have brought into the country and which scheme they fall under, because there's lots of complexities across the different schemes, and that comes on to another issue that we have around the rights and entitlements of people, depending on which scheme they come into the UK on. And I suppose the, I, I suppose the most a perverse example, in a way, would be that you could have um, somebody who has fled Afghanistan and has come um, into the UK um, in, by clandestine means, um, perhaps in small boats across the Channel, who would be uh, treated quite differently from somebody who has come in through the evacuation because they were fortunate enough to be, you know, to to get on one of the evacuation flights. So there are real concerns about the, the differential statuses and the differential treatment of people, depending how they come in. Um, obviously, we know that that, that the twenty thousand was the, the the UK government figure. Um, 
I can understand what the Scottish Government are saying. I think they're obviously saying this is diluting the commitment kind of thing. Um, but we've never taken a position as to how many people the UK as a whole should support. The, the causal position has been that Scottish local government will step up and support as many people as they can. So we've, I, I wouldn't say that we've been focused on targets and saying X number of people is, is the right number. Um, I don't know if that helps. Okay. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Was there a follow-up? Sorry. No. Did I miss a part of your question there? No. Well, well um, I, 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 sorry, there was a part. Sorry, let me just say. I, I did ask um, if there was concerns that people who need to, um, who should be accessing the scheme can't because of the the, sell, the referral requirements for it, so they can't independently refer themselves. Um, I'm not sure if you picked up on that, but I'm not sure if anybody else wants to come in on that. Sorry. Okay, so so I mean I think that's that's a challenge with refugee resettlement in general, in that yeah. there's a tiny minority of the people who are in need that manage to um, get in refugee resettlement schemes, both for the UK and across the world. So yeah, there are real concerns, and I suppose that that leads on to the, the point I was trying to make in terms of that forces people to make it, to to take other routes to get to the UK or to get to what to safety wherever that might be. And our concern is more about the differential treatment of people who come through different routes to get to the UK, and um, there 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 being different levels. And, and obviously, we've concerns around the nationality and borders bill in terms of um, accentuating these challenges in that respect as well. Thank you. Thanks very much um, for that. I'm going to now move on to um, theme four because we still have two themes to get through and our time's running short. Um, so theme four is about the nationality and borders bill. Um, and I'm going to bring in Marie McNair and then on to Pam Duncan Glancy and then my colleague Emma Roddick, who's joining us remotely. Um, so Marie McNair, um, to yourself first, thanks. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, the Scottish Refugee Council was referred to the nationality and borders bill as the anti-refugee bill and argues that it's the biggest threat to refugee rights in decades. Do the panel share that view and what are the biggest concerns about the impact it will have on migrants, uh, refugees and asylum seekers? I'll just throw that out to the whole panel, anyone that can answer it, thanks. Okay, so we need somebody to start us off, so I'll go with Susan, whose hand I can see. Susan, thanks. Um, thanks. I mean, I think this is... Um... It obviously, uh, a, a, a political question. As the only politician in the panel, I think I should probably. Um, it's, it's maybe not fair to ask uh, um, officials to to comment um, on on this. Um, but I would say certainly I, I agree entirely with the Scottish Refugee Council's assessment. Um, it is a it is a draconian um, bill. You know, and it's not just the Scottish Refugee Council. There are many others um, who um, understand. Uh, the laws, international laws and obligations around refugees uh, far better than I do, who are of the view that this really undermines um, the, the, the UK's um, commitment and, and obligations under international treaties uh, to, uh, to support refugees. And the, 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 the differentiation between the way that people enter the country, which um, Andy's already touched on um, as causing a whole number of um, of operational challenges um, is also something that is, um, you know, it, it's it's very questionable in terms of how it tries to create uh, categories of um, of good and bad refugee and asylum seeker, um, and, and certainly it is um, it is ignorant of uh, chooses to be ignorant of the, um, the the circumstances in which people desperate people fleeing trauma. Uh, and are, are fleeing uh, threats to their, their lives um, and their families' lives, the, the desperate circumstances in which they find themselves um, and, and the lack of choice that they have um, in their ability to, um, to, to seek refuge, uh, to remove themselves from, from life-threatening situations. Uh, people don't always, um, in fact, very seldom have the choice to, uh, to, to leave their countries of origin um, and uh, and, and seek asylum elsewhere through um, kind of ordered and formal routes. 
um, and, and desperate people will, will uh, take, um, take uh, any route that they can and, and they, will, they will clutch at any straw that they are able to, uh, to save themselves and their, their families. I think there's, there's another element to it which has perhaps been less have been given less attention, um, and, and which you know I'm certainly very grateful to Scottish Refugee Council for for briefings that they've provided, which has helped to clarify this issue for me. Um, but there are there are other elements uh, within that bill which, you know, if they were to take full effect, would essentially lead to the dismantling of. The, the, the asylum dispersal system in the UK as we understand it just now. Now, although I, I have criticisms of the way that system operates, um, particularly around its, it, the, the chronic underfunding of it, but also around um, the, the UK government's insistence on running it through private contracts, uh, you know, I think you know that's that's another argument um, and another discussion. Um, the, the asylum dispersal system, um, I, I, you know, fundamentally has allowed Glasgow, for example, and um, you know, I, I don't think we're blowing our own trumpet to say that Glasgow is an example of a very successful asylum authority in terms of the outcomes um, that we have achieved. Um, in terms of integration between uh, asylum seekers and the uh, the receiving community, um, and indeed outcomes for for asylum seekers um, themselves uh, as as individuals and individual households, but it would massively undermine our ability to achieve those outcomes, which should be the point of an asylum system. The ultimate point should be to provide um, that support to people to recover from trauma, uh, to um, to be able to go on and live um, as close to normal lives as they are able to do, given the circumstances from which they have come, and to, to live within the community in which they have resettled um, as uh, members of that community and, and to make a contribution. Um, and, and many, many people, um, hundreds and thousands of people um, over the years uh, in Glasgow over the past 20 years have been able to do that um, and have, um, you know, we, we all know um, of some, some very prominent individuals who are uh, great success stories in the city and others whose names will never be known but just live um, decent and good lives um, as members of their Glasgow community. The, the bill hugely potentially undermines our ability as an authority to support those positive outcomes for people by bypassing the local authority, bypassing our ability to, for example, educate asylum seekers in our own schools, um, which has been enormously important. Um, the Home Office um, would, uh, through that bill, um, reserve the right to completely remove asylum-seeking children um, and, and have them educated separately in the equivalent of the um, the, the Napier barracks, for example, that, we, the, the, um, we've seen the issues with in England more recently, or indeed uh, Dungavel, to use a, um, a closer-to-home example, which is, um, as we know, um, not only uh, reinforcing the trauma that, that people have been through um, and, and adding to it, um, exam um, actually uh, exacerbating that trauma, it absolutely prevents the, the delivery of those um, outcomes that we want to see for people. It is um, an even greater conflation um, of the asylum system with um, a a hostile approach to, to immigration uh, than we have already in the UK. Um, and that um, absolutely militates against um, what I believe the asylum and refugee system should be about, which is achieving those positive outcomes for um, people who have fled uh, trauma and, um, and, and, and violence um, and the, you know, our ability as uh, nations who are able to provide them with a safe space to then live their lives safely and securely as part of their new communities. Um, the, I, I think it, um, it puts all of that at risk, um, and that is something that we need to be very aware of. And a lot of the questions that we're discussing today around the challenges that Glasgow faces as an asylum authority um, would just become moot points, to be honest, because... Um, the, uh, the asylum dispersal system, as we understand it, with all its weaknesses, but also all of its successes, would really be pretty much dismantled. Thank you very much for that. Marie, did you have any further question on that? 
Uh, thank you, Convener, and, and thanks, Susan, for that response. Um, Siobhan uh, Mullally, the, the U, UN Special Rapporteur, said that the bill fails to acknowledge the government's obligation to ensure protection for migrant and asylum-seeking children and greatly increase the risk of statelessness and in, the, in violation of international law. Um, Causal suggests that the bill um, may affect uh, uh, devolved safeguarding and, and protection duties. I just can ask uh, Andrew, can you further explain uh, on that one? Thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah, happy to. Uh, I, I, and I suppose uh, our, our fundamental concerns before just coming on to that, and I think Councillor Aitken has explained that better than I can, but our concern is around this creation of a hierarchy of rights for people. Uh, where people are treated differentially depending on the way that they've, that they've come into the country, and uh, following on from that, uh, you know, another key concern for us is that, you know, our fundamental belief is that local services are the best place to to make decisions about the the needs of of individuals and families in their communities, and I think what we're trying to get at in this point is that. Um, some of the provisions in the bill um, will um, create a situation where that is no longer the case. So, for instance, in relation to the age assessment process for for uh, young people that come in to the asylum system, or young victims of trafficking, for that matter, as well, um, local services undertake age assessments as and when they deem that to be appropriate, and that's being um, overridden. Um, uh, potentially by what's being proposed in the in the bill with the creation of a national age assessment board so we've got concerns about how that's going to play out and I'm aware that the Scottish government have um, highlighted their concerns and there's now a, a legislative consent motion about um, that age assessment a uh, particular age assessment uh, work I think as well in, in terms of what councillor Aitken was saying around the asylum system specifically obviously, there are um, there are intentions around the creation of or establishment of reception centres, and again we would have concerns, uh, safeguarding concerns about um, how uh, uh, women, men, and children, that everybody uh, is accommodated in these, and whether they are appropriately protected in those situations, especially those who are particularly vulnerable. And I suppose the other point that that, that we would make, and and we can draw example, provide examples of. Of where there is actually positive work with the Home Office, that it feels like it's kind of being well, it is being undermined by the overarching approach of this bill. So, to give one example in relation to um, human trafficking, there's actually a pilot underway in, involving the Home Office, uh, uh, Glasgow Scottish Government, COSLA, working together. Uh, to see if we can improve mechanisms around the national referral mechanism for victims of traf trafficking, because at the moment the, the, the process is pretty cumbersome, and so we saw this as a really positive move in which um, it's acknowledged that the best people to, to, to make decisions are those who are on the ground, who know the children, who know the cases that they are dealing with. But this, the, the bill, seems to set that type of work aside and create a, a top-down approach, which. Um, does cause us um, concerns around safeguarding and protection. So, hope that helps. Thank you. Thank um, you, Kirina. That's me for my questions. Thanks. That's great. Thank you, um, Mary, for for your your questions. I'm now going to bring in my colleague um, Pam Duncan Glancy, and then after that, we'll have Emma Roddick. Um, thank, thank you, Convener. A number of the questions I had around the Nationality and Borders Bill um, have been answered, but I'd just like to put, put on record um, that, that I do believe it is a cruel and impractical bill that does not achieve what it is set out to achieve, um, even if we don't agree with what it was meant to achieve in the first place. Um, so I just think it's important to put that on the record, and I thank the, the panel for their answers. Thanks very much, Pam. Over to Emma Roddick. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, this one is uh, really for Alistair. Um, overall, in, in your view, how does the, the Scottish Government's approach um, in the New Scots refugee strategy differ from the UK's approach towards asylum seekers and refugees? So, necessarily, I come to that question without entirely understanding 
the, the, the comparison, uh, my, my experience being entirely within Scotland and within the context of the new Scots strategy. The primary dis difference, as I understand it, is the Scottish Government's uh, focus on integration from day one. Uh, that provides both an opportunity and I think an obligation on those of us in local government and the third sector to work with people from the point of arrival. Um, the strategy is comprehensive, uh, brings in all of the players who would wish to play a part. And in the five years or so that I've been working in this field, I found it to be a very helpful underpinning. Emma, do you have a further question? Yes, um, just around the um, legislative consent motion um, that's been put down this week. Um, Scotland has established age assessment practices, which are carried out by trained social work professionals um, in line with the getting it right for every child approach. Um, what's your view on the UK government's proposals on reforming age assessment processes? I think we'll ask others that, um, seeing as we're looking for a UK um, vision. I think that might need to be a question for Susan. Um, I'm actually, I think Pat might be better placed to answer in terms of the operational impact. Um, I, uh, I, I mean, I, I don't, uh, I'm not familiar with um, with the particular detail of um, of this uh, suggested um, policy change approach um, in in England and the UK. Uh, what what I would say is that uh, the the approach in Scotland um, is the one that um, you know it, it is about trained professionals um, who are you know coming to it with um, social work values uh, and or, or and health service values, um, assessing the needs of a young person so that we can meet those needs. Um, if there is a shift towards age assessment as a way to to try to catch out a young person, um, to try to uh, say that they, they don't have needs or they don't have entitlements, um, then I think that is entirely the wrong approach and, and is um, it is completely from from the wrong direction. Um, the, the way in which we approach it in Scotland, which is about um, trying to understand how we best support a young person, um, is is absolutely um, that that should be the underpinning um, of how we we work with um, children and young people in the system. I think Pat wants to come in as well, Pat. Um, really, just 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 to add to that, um, and it picks up on the conversation we were having earlier on in relation to uh, the Borders Bill as well. But in terms of specifically the, the age assessment, um, the, the pilot that is underway in Glasgow is precisely what we have been looking for for really quite some time. The national referral mechanism, as has already been pointed out, is hugely cumbersome. It, is re it takes a a considerable amount of time to really get any proper uh, uh, final assessment on, um, and, and it's right and proper that it is front-facing qualified social workers who undertake this assessment. Just, just as you had pointed out, um, in relation to GERFEC, in relation to the Children and Young Person Act 2014, Children Scotland Act 1995, and it runs a considerable risk of really confusing this entire landscape. Um, there are other questions that we have in relation to that, and really that is uh, the role of the National Age Assessment Board. Um, if, uh, you know, uh, do they supersede the decision, the, the assessment from the local authority? Um, and then it's further, it's further compounded by um, any potential appeals process um, and who who we are appealing against, and indeed legal aid for 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 all of that. So there is a number of questions that we have. Um, there is quite significant operational practice issues that we still have to continue to work through. We are in close contact with the Scottish Government, working our way through this just now, and we will continue to ask and probe those types of questions. But I think what we have at the moment um, is a pilot 
um, that is what we have been looking for and what we have been asking for really for quite some time. And there has been a substantial amount of work that has went into this with the Home Office and ourselves to get where we are just now. So it feels as though it is a bit of a backward step um, in relation to the, the whole age assessment profile. Thank you um, for that. I think I'm I'm just going to kind of group my my questions that I was going to ask later on just now for for the sake of time. Um, I'm not sure if Callum's back, but if not, I'll I'll um, ask Susan. Uh, within the Scottish government guidance, it's made clear that people seeking asylum can and should be entered onto social landlords lists if they apply for social housing, even though they're not entitled to the housing until they're granted refugee status. Um, do you feel that there's anything more that can be done both to encourage people to get on the list early and to widen social landlord awareness of that guidance? Um, certainly in Glasgow, I think the, um, the, the partnerships that we have uh, with, with RSLs, of which, of which there, are, there are over 80 in Glasgow, a um, network of, of community-led housing associations, um, I, think, I think the awareness is, is, is very good. Um, RSLs obviously have their own challenges in terms of in terms of supply, um, and there are you know it's it's what we talked about earlier with the the Afghan resettlement scheme, um, their their ability to um, to plan when um, a plan ahead, uh, given the amount of time someone can spend in the system, um, is is challenged. Um, so I think the the issue um, is is very much about trying to get decisions for people much, much faster. Now, that is something that's very much in, in the hands of uh, the Home Office, obviously. Um, it, it's not something that we um, have any control over in Scotland. But the principle is, it, yes, is absolutely correct, the principle of um, planning as early as possible for um, ensuring um, that the person, when uh, and, and we hope that they will reach the positive outcome when they get that positive outcome that we are able to move as quickly as possible to get all of that support in place to transition them um, as smoothly out of the asylum accommodation which um, is run by the Home Office contractor um, into um, a home uh, in, in Glasgow, uh, whether that's with um, an RSL or, or through another route. Um, all of that principle is, is absolutely correct. Um, and, and certainly, uh, the relationships and the partnerships that we have with our RSLs in Glasgow will um, focus on on trying to have that happen um, as much as possible. But as I say, the the uncertainty and the uh, often very very protracted timescales within the process, and pe people, um, you know, as you know, will will be in um, asylum accommodation uh, for years sometimes. Uh, as and as they go through the process and, and as they work their way through appeals, um, so that that does make it challenging for um, for RSLs to be able to to plan, particularly the smaller ones, um, and out of whom we have um, a number in the city. I would say as well that, and this is an issue, an ongoing discussion, shall we say, that we have we have with uh, with Mears and indeed had with with previous contractors in the city that we're um, very keen in Glasgow that. Uh, we, we do have citywide um, integration um, of people who have come through the asylum system as well, and that there isn't an over concentration in one neighbourhood or another. Um, that has been an issue where um, the uh, the contractor have have tended to um, well essentially to focus their purchase of accommodation where where accommodation is cheapest, uh, where rents are cheapest, and that has meant then put in. Um, an over concentration of um, asylum accommodation in parts of the city, where there are already um, uh, there's already an over concentration of, of deprivation um, and and, uh, and and SIMD levels, for example. So uh, we would want exactly the same outcomes to be achieved uh, when people have got through the system. We want them to be able to have access to a range of accommodation um, right right across the city, um, because that is genuine integration, and that, and that's what we're uh, we we want to encourage as much as possible. That we don't have Callum back. I don't know whether it would be helpful for us to get that information from Callum. I mean, you could write into the the committee. 
Yep. Do you have any further questions you want to ask? That's me. Thanks, convener. Thanks very much for that, Emma. And um, we're getting into our last few questions now. Um, so I'm going to bring Pam Duncan Glancy in and then Jeremy Balfour and then from the Equalities Committee perspective, um, Pam goes all after that. So Pam, over to yourself first. Thank you, Convener. Um, and I have three short questions. I'll, 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 try, I'll try and be, be brief. Um, Maryhill Integration Network, who I want to put on record to say thank you for the incredible work they're doing for, for the people who um, they support in Glasgow, have highlighted that they're concerned to hear about Glasgow City Council's withdrawn from the UK government's dispersal scheme. But I, I think I've heard today that that might not be the case. So I just was seeking a bit of clarification from um, Councillor Aitken um, before I go on to my further two questions. Uh, yes, absolutely. It is not the case. This has been widely misreported. It is very, very frustrating. Not only has Glasgow not withdrawn from the um, asylum dispersal scheme, we are, by some distance, the biggest asylum authority in the UK, both in terms of uh, the numbers of asylum seekers in Glasgow per head of population, but also just in terms of actual overall numbers. Uh, we have over 5,000 asylum seekers in Glasgow and have done for some time. As it happens, that is um, more than double the number that the Home Office's own assessment says that proportionally um, to, to, to the size of our population, Glasgow should host. Um, so, so we are extremely active members um, and, and extremely active um, island, uh, asylum dispersal authority. Um, what we do have um, is uh, an agreement with the Home Office, um, which has been put in place really post the, the Park Inn incident, but, but it was, it was um, there before that. But it, I think the, the Park Inn incident um, emphasised how, how important it is uh, that we do not, that there is a pause on um, essentially unlimited dispersal um, of certain types of asylum seeker from Glasgow to the UK. So we still have asylum seekers coming into the city on a daily basis who are accommodated in Glasgow. Um, we also still have dispersal from other parts of the UK of families with children, for example. But we do have a pause on dispersal of primarily um, single male asylum seekers, which is, is a very large number, very large proportion um, of the asylum seeking population in the UK. And the reason for that um, is because um, of, of very significant concerns about the impact on the welfare and the well-being and the best interests of both of asylum seekers coming into the city um, but the asylum seekers who are already here. And while we still have asylum seekers living in hotel accommodation in Glasgow, which as a, as a local authority, um, we are on the record as being fundamentally opposed to, we want to see an end to that. Um, and, and we are, um, have been pushing the Home Office very, very strongly um, for, um, well, particularly since the park incident, uh, for timetables and for an end to the numbers of asylum... To, to, to asylum seekers being accommodated in hotel accommodation in the city. Um, until we, um, we have a clear uh, end in sight uh, for that um, and also a clear uh, reassurance from the Home Office and from their contractors that they will be able to accommodate people coming into the city safely and securely um, and with um, uh, the focus on their best interests, um, then we would prefer that pause to stay in place. This is entirely about the best interests of asylum seekers. Um, I think it's very, very important that we don't fall into the trap of talking about um, an asylum authority and the numbers of people coming in as a numbers game. You know, it, it isn't about um, how many folk we can cram into the city. It's about the outcomes that we achieve for them and about their best interests. And because, and this is not in Glasgow City Council's gift, um, I need to, I need to emphasise, because the Home Office contractor, um, private contractor, uh, was not um, able to, uh, or you know, was not at that point accommodating people coming in in um, accommodation, certainly that we would consider to be uh, appropriate, um, then, you know, we, we express those very, very significant concerns. We were expressing concerns, and indeed, Glasgow um, historically hasn't accommodated people um, in hotels, um, and that's because uh, Pat and his colleagues um, in the HSCP have 
as much as they are able to put their foot down on that and said to the contractors, no, we, we don't agree with that. We don't believe it's appropriate. Now, we don't actually have the power to force them to not put people in hotels, but we have used our influence, um, if you like, as strongly as possible. It's pretty common in other parts of the UK um, for asylum seekers to be accommodated in hotels. Um, we agreed temporarily with Mears um, that they could use hotel accommodation as an emergency measure once the pandemic uh, set in, um, in, in uh, um, as a response to a public health emergency, uh, because clearly getting people into accommodation um, and, and giving them the ability to self-isolate, for example, uh, was, was extremely important at that point. Um, but we always saw it very much as an emergency measure. Um, we did not agree to people who were already in asylum accommodation being removed from their asylum accommodation and put into hotels. That was not something um, that we agreed to and that we strongly um, opposed and, and have made our views on very, very clear um, to the Home Office repeatedly. Uh, but we, I cannot emphasise enough, not only has Glasgow not withdrawn from the asylum dispersal system, we are the most, uh, the biggest contributor to that system in the UK by some distance. We continue to receive and accommodate asylum seekers in the city, uh, but we will also continue to do as much as we can to try to ensure that the system operates safely within the city as much as we are able. Um, and, and we have um, an exam we have examples that we're all too well aware of um, of where it didn't operate safely and where the use of hotel accommodation uh, by the Home Office contractors ended in um, appalling tragedy. So those are the reasons why uh, we have um, the agreement with the Home Office just now to um, to place uh, some, some limits on uh, the numbers of people who are dispersed to Glasgow until we can have that assurance around uh, the best interests um, of people coming into the city being served. And th thank you for that considerable, um, con considerable lengthy and, and detailed answer. There's a couple of points I'll, I'll follow up out with this session, if that's all right, in the interest of time. Um, but thank you for that. I appreciate you putting that on the record. Um, the, an organisation called Bridges contacted us ahead of today and explained um, their, their concerns around a number of um, changes that happened during the pandemic that maybe didn't take into account um, minority groups in the way that it could have. And we know that this is seen across um, minority groups. Um, and it didn't perhaps consider um, the experience, for example, of the people who were living in, in those types of accommodation. Um, how important do um, members of the panel think it is that asylum seekers and refugees, as a result of this, are included in the COVID-19 inquiry in Scotland? Would you like to direct that to? Um, could I, I direct that to um, Councillor Aitken and um, Andrew Morrison, please? Briefly. Um, yes, I, I do think it's important because the, the response to um, the, as we've already heard, uh, the, um, the COVID situation, the, the public health emergency, significantly changed some of the ways um, in which we um, support asylum seekers and refugees, particularly people with no recourse to public funds. Um, so I do think it, it, it would be very important to capture that experience um, and that response um, in, in all of the, um, the, the lessons to be learned, not just in Scotland, but across the UK. Um, and, and we do, you know, I, one of the meetings that I had with um, a UK minister back last year when we discussed the... Um, the, the restart of negative cessations, which at that point where we're starting in other parts of the UK, had, had started in other parts of the UK, but which we in Glasgow were um, doing everything in our power to insist didn't start in Glasgow precisely because of the public health emergency. It was very clear at that point that the Home Office were placing a distinction between uh, people who were homeless or, you know, or, or um, potentially rough sleeping uh, because of no recourse to public funds and I suppose a kind of um, what they would call a kind of indigenous homeless population, if you like, and that they, they saw that they should be treated differently and that the, 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 um, the powers, the emergency um, response that we were using for, um, for homeless people in Glasgow should not continue to apply. Uh, to um, to people with no recourse to public funds. Now, we strongly opposed that 
and, and said that, you know, the public health emergency was a public health emergency and, it, it, you know, COVID didn't react to somebody in a different way because they were an asylum seeker um, or because they were an appeals exhausted asylum seeker. Um, they, they were just as vulnerable um, to catching COVID if, if they were placed in, a, um, in a, an at-risk situation um, to to someone who had, had um, been in Scotland for a long time. And uh, so, you know, I, I think there are, there are some issues there around teasing out where there were attempts to make distinctions between the two distinctions, which we have up until now, as I say, strongly resisted in Glasgow successfully up until this point, how long we're able to sustain that um, and, and uh, how long it will be before the Home Office restart negative cessations um, in, in Glasgow, I, I don't know um, at this stage. I, I think we're expecting it to be, to be soon, but certainly we will continue to, to argue that um, we, we are still in a public health emergency and that that public health emergency applies just as much to asylum seekers um, and uh, indeed uh, people with no recourse to public funds as it does to uh, the rest of the population. Um, so for, for those kinds of reasons, those issues that have emerged during the pandemic, I do think it would be important to capture that experience um, in, a, in any lessons learned exercise. Very briefly, um, to, to add any thoughts to that, we are significantly over time and I am conscious that I still have to get to Pam Gossel as well. <coughs> Andy, did you have any thoughts? Yeah, sorry, I'm just aware uh, Pam had, had asked me as well. It's really just to echo what uh, Councillor Aitken had said, so I agree with everything that she had said and I think across all policy considerations, refugee and asylum seekers should be considered, and I suppose that's a central aspect of the work that we're trying to do through both the new Scots Refugee Integration Strategy, but also ending destitution together. It's trying to ensure that that takes place. So it was really just to re-emphasise that. Many thanks. Pam, did you have... Thank you, I did, but in the interest of time, I'll, I'll, I'll save it for another day. If it's something you want to have yeah. in writing, we'll, we'll make sure we do get it for you. Thank you. Um, Jeremy, I know that you have further questions, and then Pam Gossel. Uh, thank you, Mina. I, I will uh, be brief. The first question I was going to ask uh, was to Alistair Dinney. Um, I should just declare for the record that Alistair and I uh, worked together when um, we were at the Council, so um, I, I do know Alistair. Alistair, we are running out of time. Um, but I think one of the things that worked really well in Edinburgh was the Syrian um, project. And I wonder if you would mind just writing to the committee to give us some information around how that worked and why did it work so well and lessons learned. Um, there's a lot there, I know. And perhaps it would be easier rather than giving a brief answer if you could put that in writing to us, if that would be OK with you. Happy to do that. Thank you. Uh, and my second question is, uh, obviously, uh, some of the issues we've been talking about have been reserved, but there are issues which are, are, are devolved. And um, I was slightly surprised to see in one of the submissions that um, the free bus travel for those under 22 has not been extended to asylum seekers. And I just wonder whether Cosler, Andrew, could maybe give us a brief discussion. What discussions did you have with Scottish Government uh, around that, and what reason did the Scottish Government give n not to grant that to asylum seekers? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. And, and actually, I was I was going to come on to in, in my answer to Pam's question, and I thought that um, uh, I wouldn't have the time. But uh, so, but thanks for raising. I think that is an example of probably what I was saying around the need for refugees and asylum seekers to be considered at the outset of all policy making and the, 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 that example there kind of shows that, that, it, that it didn't happen. So we became aware of that only recently in the last couple of weeks um, when it was announced because my immediate question was does this, does this apply to asylum seekers and, and obviously the, the likes of Bridges and, and Scottish Refugee Council um, have flagged strongly and rightly that it doesn't apply to asylum seekers. So we have been uh, feeding into Scottish Government around uh, the position around asylum seekers. I, I'm not sure if it's been resolved in recent days, but I certainly would hope that it is going to be. And happy to follow up with you in writing on the latest position. I've, I've not heard in the last week where we are on it. That would be helpful. I mean, I think the other issue would be helpful for us 
Um, obviously, things like health and education are devolved. If there are other policy areas that you feel have either just been forgotten about or missed in regard to asylum seekers, if you could provide us in writing with that so we can maybe follow up with Scottish Government around areas where more can be done on devolved issues. But again, conscious of time, if you can maybe do that in writing, I'd be obliged. No problem. Well done. Thank you, Kavina. That's fantastic, um, and I think that we will look forward to receiving um, that information, Andy. Um, I'm going to hand over to Pam Gossel, who has a few questions. Over to yourself, Pam. Thank you, convener, and good morning, panel. It's been really interesting and very informative listening to all the responses. Uh, as the convener said, that I, I am from the Equalities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee, and in the Equalities Committee, we have been discussing a human rights-based approach to the budgets. Do you think that the local authorities would benefit from looking through an intersectional lens when it comes to uh, distributing and balancing resources to support those with no recourse to public funds provision? And my answer, sorry, my question <laughs> goes over to Andrew. Okay, uh, thanks for that, Pam. And again, this is maybe something that we can follow up with you on in writing. Um, I think obviously a human rights based approach to, to all work is something that, that we want to achieve. And I know that's going to be a, a key element of work in, the, in relation to the human rights bill. I think the, the, the biggie for us in, in this will be ensuring that local authorities are equipped um, to, to do that. So, uh, um, staff across councils and across the stat statutory services are equipped to know what, what, what it means to take a human rights based approach, um, whether it's to budgeting or to the provision of services. And I think there's, there's a, a significant uh, body of work that will be required to uh, support councils in that regard. Um, in terms of the approach to budgets, I probably don't have a, a, a uh, an immediate response around that, but I'm happy to to go away and provide something to you in writing about what a, if there is a particular position that we've taken on that. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, and I've got another question, just one quick one for Alistair. The Home Secretary has announced 14 million of funding to support newly granted refugees to learn English, move into work, access housing, and build links with local communities. Do you think? That this is sustain, you know, sustainable. I mean, do you think it's a sustainable approach to reducing destitution among refugees? And if not, or if so, what more do you think has to be done? Thanks for the question. And it may be that I don't entirely understand what's meant by the announcement. But it strikes me that, but certainly in my experience, there is a big difference between the ability to support, inverted commas, refugees, where the funding that comes by the UK government uh, is generally appropriate for the support that we want to give, and particularly around things like school support for English as a second language and ESOL training for adults. The difficulty comes with those who do not benefit from that kind of Home Office funding, whether that is people who are inverted commas asylum seekers, or for example, households that have come together because a family member has come through the asylum system and then has been joined by other family members under family reunion. And in that situation, we can certainly see a situation where we have two households, very similar profiles, very similar experiences, but treated very differently because of the funding that one can access and the other cannot. So I think I'd like to know a bit more about exactly what the Home Secretary meant by her announcement, or I, I, I expressed a, a, a full opinion. Thank you, Alistair. And that's me, convener. Thank you very much. 
Thanks for your questions, Pam. Um, we did have some questions round about um, the Scottish Government's lodging of their legislative consent memorandum. Um, but in the interest of time, I think we will write out to, to witnesses and ask for their thoughts on the, the two specific clauses um, that are in the devolved competencies. Um, so what I would like to do is thank witnesses for their evidence and Pam Gossel for joining the meeting. Um, and you're welcome to, to follow up on any points that you think we need to have fleshed out. Um, and thank you for offering where you've already done so to do that. Um, so that concludes this morning's public part of the meeting. Um, next week we're going to continue taking evidence um, on refugees and asylum seekers and we're now going to move into private session to considering our remaining agenda items and members who have been joining us online I will ask you now to move into the Teams link that you will find in your calendar um, and I close the, uh, the open session of this meeting. Thank you.